right, welcome back to another episode of Naked CTF. My name is Jono from Open Learn Sec. And in Naked CTF, it's a one shot, uh, one take, no edit um, video of me attempting to do a capture the flag exercise from Hack the Box. In this case, today we're doing, uh, just a second, we are doing La Casa de Papel. Um, so it's a Linux host. And there's only uh, adventure mode. There's no guided mode. So normally there's a second option here that lets you um, select uh, guided mode, which will give you some clues uh, or some hints on where to kind of look next as you move through uh, each step of the exploitation chain. So this could be interesting. Uh, again, I've not touched this before. I don't know anything about it. Um, the whole point of this is that it's uh, to do my learning in the open as I work, work towards uh, the OSCP uh, certification and to just share, you know, the ups and downs, the highs and lows of some of these uh, steps. And so this should be interesting. I did have often relied, uh, relied on guided mode um, to actually, you know, kind of move things forward when we get stuck normally, which is from the Privesque point of view. So going from a regular user to the administrator or a root user. So we may need to step into the write-up today if we get stuck, hoping that's not the case. But anyway, um, with all that said, let's get started. So we've got the host running here. Uh, 10, 10, 10, 1, 3, 1 is our, uh, our address. So as always, we're going to do some enumeration, top 1,000 ports. Uh, on nmap1.txt p4 timing and minus v so we'll let that run straight away four ports are open 21 22 80 and 443 um, so we'll just let the version detection or service fingerprinting complete and we'll have a little bit more information about what those are and that will give us kind of our first um bunch of, uh, well, first, first services to continue enumeration on and have a look. So 21 is VSFTP'd 2.3.4. Uh, 22 is open SSH. Uh, interestingly, no um, operating system uh, being detected through the fingerprinting. Uh, port 80 and port 443 is uh, web servers. So uh, on 80, it's a Node.js application. HTML uh, returned in the title tag tells us La Casa del Papel. Um, then if we look at the HTTPS, uh, from the SSL or TLS certificate, we can see the CN or the common name is La Casa del, La Casa de Papel. I'm gonna get that right at some point. Um, so we do know that this might be a domain name associated with it. Let's see um, if we actually need it to um, access, uh, to, to be able to visit the site. Um, there's no 301 or anything like that happening. Uh, the both web servers get head post and options. So again, you know, might be of interest later on. Service info Unix, okay, not very particular, but we've got what we've got. So first thing I'm going to do is start to compile my notes and we'll just take this nmap output. If the scroll decides to work. Okay, that'll do. I've got my Obsidian application here that I'm just going to keep my notes in. Uh, again, trying to get better with note taking as we go especially when enumeration starts to get really complex, like a couple of episodes back, um, we had to enumerate a bunch of stuff, a lot of red herrings and decoys and everything else. Um, so, and obviously with OSCP, you need to uh, be able to demonstrate that you can take appropriate document, or create appropriate documentation and write, write reports. So we'll continue to work on that. So where do we start? Um, SSH, I think we just leave alone. We don't want to be doing any kind of brute forcing yet until we have some further intelligence uh, through the enumeration process. 
Uh, FPT will do a quick check for um, the uh, anonymous access to FTP. Uh, and then we'll check out both these websites. So why don't we just start with FTP? Um, we will also look at the FTP version um, because VSFTP, from my experience, has a number of uh, you know well-known CVEs that um, basically let you obtain some sort of remote ex uh, remote execution or something along those lines. Uh, just a guess at this point, but I think two three four is quite an old version. Um, so with that, let's have a go, uh, 10, 10, 10, 151, that's the IP, right? Oh, 131. So let's try anonymous access. And login correct. So we'll try one more time. Nope, oh, nothing there. So we obviously need some credentials um, to potentially access that FTP service. Let's have a look at the website. We'll look at port 80 HTTP first. 10, 10, 1, 3, 1. And yeah, it looks like a, I don't know what this is, but we have a QR code, one password, install. Google Authenticator, um, I actually have that on my phone, so we can use that if we need to. Get free trial, what does that do? Not much, seems to link to the same page. A quick look at the source. Uh, inline CSS, and then all the HTML is kind of on one line here at the bottom, and not very, tidy at all. Uh, we may need to paste this into an editor and clean it up. I don't know if you can actually nice. Let's turn on wrap, might make things a bit easier. So form, method posts, input type is image. That looks like the QR token um, that we saw on the page there. Uh, input name is secret, type is hidden. This is probably the seed for this QR code. Um, input type, name is token, type is text, one password. So it's not a form as in, like there's no submit button. There is a button here. Um, email test at test.com and that's the button. Doesn't seem to do anything, return anything. Um, okay. That's a link to the Google Authenticator app in the Play Store. Um, okay. Interesting. So I would say this. QR code and, oh, okay. So we need to scan the QR code, generate the one-time pin and uh, submit an email. Okay, let's try that. I'm just gonna get my phone and we'll set this up. Maybe I'll just refresh, make sure the token is, uh, I don't know if it changes every time you refresh, but let's have a look. So, Sorry, you can't see this, but I'm just opening up my uh, Authenticator app. And I want to add a new one. Scan QR. This is pretty cool. Token couldn't be read. Please try again. Okay. Um, let's try it some other way. All right, worked that time. So I'm just going to do test at test.com and then wait for a new token 00006076. Get free trial. Uh, 
yeah, no feedback, no error message, nothing like that. So not quite sure what's going on. This guy in the corner here, these two guys are freaking me out a little bit the way they're looking at me. I'm sure they're lovely guys, but uh, looking a bit tough. So that's the HTTP site. Let's just quickly check HTTPS if it's the same or different. Uh, advanced, accept the risk and continue. Certificate error, sorry, but you need to provide a client certificate to continue. Oh, okay. Now, I wonder if it's talking about a client side certificate, because I mean, I know like in the 2000s, that was kind of a popular way to do things is that instead of, well, not necessarily popular, but it was somewhat in practice where instead of using a username and password, you would have a certificate um, that your browser would present and that would be your credentials. Uh, or it would be a certificate coming from a device or uh, like a, to a hardware token or something like that. Doesn't seem to be fairly common these days. I mean, I don't see it a lot, um, but yeah. So that's interesting. It's kind of the same website, but on both port 80 and port 443, but this guy is with a weird mustache is kind of saying, you need to provide a client certificate to continue. And then if we go back to the HTTP version, if we, if we generate a one-time pin and I mean, maybe it's actually sending me an email with some information. So I'm going to put a legit email address in there just in case it is sending me something. Um, let me get the authenticator back out. And I don't know if I need to add again using the QR. Yeah, it already exists. So the the the, the, the seed value for the uh, for uh, the to well, the token seems to stay the same. Um, so 301432. And okay. I'm just going to check off camera if any email has arrived. Just a moment, please. And do I have Gmail open? No, I don't. Okay. Nope, no email. Um, so I might just double check, uh, check my spam, make sure it didn't end up there. No spam. Yeah, so it doesn't look like it's sending me a link or something to take this uh, kind of user journey or flow any further. So interesting. Okay. Um, four, four, three, 80 FTP and SSH. Um, so we're not kind of locked on to any credentials yet. If we view the page source, is there any hints about what it might be? Not really. Um, what I might do is get some directory buster, the buster going, go buster, directory busting with go buster. So go buster, the, uh, minus a minus u HTTPS. Uh, ten dot ten dot ten dot one three one word list is going to be user share word lists. Um, what was the list I was using last time? What happened in my history? Okay. 
Durbuster, it's Durbuster medium. Okay. Durbuster, the minus K, minus U, HTTP. So we need to run it twice because it looks like it might be two different websites. Uh, word list user share word lists. Durbuster, and then the directory list medium. Okay. And then here we'll run on the HTTPS site. Uh, minus K, minus U, HTTPS, 10.10.10.131. Word list is user share word lists, the buster, directory list. 2.3 medium.txt. Uh, server returns a status code that matches the provided options for non existing URLs. <clears throat> so I think what GoBuster is saying is that in the case of the HTTPS website, it doesn't matter what URL you visit. Oh, okay, it's redirecting. So we should definitely add this domain and be using the host name rather than the um, IP address. So sudo vim etsy hosts. Then we're going to add 10, 10, 10, 1, 3, 1. And then the domain la casa de, la casa de pel. Okay, so that does change a few things because there might have been some redirect attempts um, that we weren't watching or didn't observe before. Um, yeah. So that still gives you 302. Okay. HTTP is okay. So let's do HTTP, yep, and then HTTPS. Okay, advanced, accept and continue. Now what GoBuster is saying is that, yeah, you see, regardless of the URL, you can put anything in, in there. Or, okay, I cannot get that. But if I do slash A, Yeah, um, okay, so we need to exclude the status code 302. Uh, so go buster, oh. Uh, and go buster exclude status code because the go buster command line help is not 100%, doesn't, um, doesn't always have every option listed and there's no man page and yeah, I need to figure it out. Um, yeah, so the website, the web server you're attacking is configured to always respond uh, with 200 response code, which means it can't tell what's real and what's not. Um, so yeah, let's try just seeing what the actual Output is when we go to HTTPS. So we get TLS handshake. Uh, we need to tell it to ignore. Mm. We need to tell Perl to ignore the certificate, the fact that it's invalid. There's no uh, normal content length. E nor nor Option tells curl to ignore certificate revocation checks. That's not what we want. So 
So SSL required or not required, version two, version three. And man pages are always too much. Uh, curl, ignore. DLS certificate error. Use the minus K, same as GoBuster. Okay. So we'll run that again, minus K. K. And let's look at the HTTP back and forth. So we get, and then, yeah, there's no redirect or anything like that. It's simply just, um, it's simply just returning HTML. There's no 302 redirect that's being followed. Um, let's try random. And in that case, there is a 302, yeah. Yeah. So, that's why GoBuster for the HTTPS site is complaining because basically every single URL it tries is going to be a 30 is going to get 302 uh, redirect back. So dealing with GoBuster, we want to uh, okay. So instead of saying ignore this particular HTTP status code. We want to whitelist the ones that we do want. So this looks pretty good, but there's no 200 in that list. Positive status codes. So we want to take that and we want to add 200 to that as well. Maybe we want the blacklist instead, which is minus B, minus B, 301, 302. Yeah, okay, so that looks a bit better. It's ignoring all the random 302s and we'll just return a good, um, results that it finds like a HTTP 200. So we finished the Durbuster on the, we finished Durbusting the HTTP site. I mean, that's a pretty decent list, 220,000 um, suggested directory names and it found nothing, nothing at all. So I don't hold a lot of hope for um, this one on the HTTPS site. Um, I still feel that there is something funky that we've got to figure out here. Um, I mean, I put the, use the QR code, set it up as an OTP within, uh, authenticator. I put in an email, uh, I put in the one-time password from authenticator, submit it. And I didn't get anything back. I'll just double check that nothing's arrived. Nope. No email, nothing. So looks like this is a private club of some, some sort. Um, so with no credentials, no obvious, um, Let's see zero, interesting. Nothing obvious to investigate on the website. Um, like there's no form that we can attack. I mean, maybe we could uh, try fiddling with this in Burp Suite or something to see if we can um, inject.
But I do want to have a quick look. I mean, there's no anonymous access on um, FTP, but I do want to have a look at this because I feel this is a very old version. ESFTP current version. Yeah, I mean, it's on 305, 234, 2.3.4. Yeah, backdoor command execution. Two three four. Okay. Turn it to the FTP port. So basically, open a uh, kind of a raw socket using the Telnet library, and then it writes a. Carriage return. I mean, that seems pretty damn basic. So, yeah, let's have a look at the CVE. Okay. Let's do a search on search exploit, which I know is the same as uh, exploit DB. Two, three, four, command execution. So they have two uh, exploits, it looks like for the same bug, backdoor command execution. Um, so let's get that, exploit minus X, and then 49757. This is finding all sorts of weird stuff. Uh, sent CA, I mean, they're, they look like URL included characters. Um, yeah, so search exploit, how do you actually download? Mirror. But not minus X, minus M. Less. Okay. So one argument, which is the host. Port FTP. 21 default and ASCII encoded user dot encode. What is the user object? So do you need a working set of credentials to make this work? I mean, user.encode ASCII. Um, let's just try this out. Let's see what this actually does. This is what it's sending to the FTP server.
Hmm. I don't understand how this is going to work. Like, I don't know what the actual bug here is. It looks like it's just emulating a normal F FTP session, waiting for the banner, like the server banner. Then it's writing user this. Um, and that's normal FTP protocol, right? And then it's opening. A another connection to port sixty two hundred. So is there stuff that's running on um this host which we're not kind of didn't see in the initial scan? So the initial scan was one thousand top one thousand. So it might be worth just doing. Uh, a bigger, broader scan to cover all ports. So 10, 10, 10, 1 through 1. O, N, N, that 2.txt. And then T4. Go. Oh, 1,000 ports. We need to do... But now it's scanning all 65,535. So they're definitely in the top 1,000. Look, I'm just going to run this and see what happens. Um, 497, 10, 10, 10, 1, 3, 1. From? Okay. Let's do Python. or regular Python, Python 2. Success, shell opened. Okay, I mean, I said I'm not quite understanding <clears throat> how this export actually works. Okay, that's like system OS process signal. So Provide the IP address. Host is args.host. Default FTP port. This username and password. Um, read until here. Send the usernames and the password. And then open another connection on 6200. And put it into interactive mode. Let's just run it again. So telnetlib is deprecated, fine. Success shall exit. Send. Maybe the fact that it's like, I don't know. I want more information about how it works. Understanding the vulnerabilities, that would be useful. VS FTP'd, very secure FTP daemon. Mm. 234 is a relatively old version. Known vulnerabilities including buffer overflows, format string, and authentication bypass. One of the most critical concerns was the possibility of remote code execution. Patches and updates, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, the, that is good and all, but it doesn't provide me specifics on 2523. 
What is this exploit? Test the exploit on Metasploitable 2. Uh, I mean, July 2011 lines up with the CVE. It doesn't say specifically. Pick a back door. So I think it's about sending the username and password in as a byte string that maybe causes this. There's that 6200. So let's try this version. I don't think I've got Pwn tools installed on here. Yep, okay. So I'm going to grab this. I mean, I'm kind of grasping at straws here to So Python three exploit .py. IP and ports so 10, 10, 10, 1, 3, 1. What? Saisha. Man, I still don't understand that. So it checks if we're connected to VS FTP 234. Triggering backdoor by sending. Yeah, it just must be like the fact that it's a byte string and not plain ASCII that causes this backdoor to happen. Look, I'm gonna dig into this later because I wanna understand exactly how this uh, vulnerability works. Like where does the shell on 6200 come from? And why is this not like, a, this is not a regular shell? This is a Psi shell, PHP 720. What is Psi shell? Sci shell. This file is part of Sci shell. Runtime developer console interactive debugger. Or PHP. Size shell can be used in interactive to debugger. So rather than using like dumping out variables and stopping the script from being processed, just drop size shell in there. Okay. So if I do like a PHP function, the info. Oh, okay. So I can like run PHP. Oh, okay. So it's not like a regular bash or system shell. It's a PHP interactive shell. Huh. Okay. So we can definitely do some stuff with this. Uh, not quite as good as a reverse shell. Still don't understand how this FTP backdoor occurs. Like, 
What the hell? Oh, okay. In July 2011, it was discovered that VSFTP version 234, downloadable from the master site, had been compromised. Logging into a compromised server may issue a smiley face as the username and getting a command shell on port 6200. Man, I have seen VSFTP many, many times in, in my life. I've never actually used it in anything I've built. Um, so someone uh, gained access to their source control system or something and replaced the release 234 with one that was backdoored. Okay. So if you ever come across VSFTP 234, uh, you can simply include a smiley face in the username and then this back backdoor shell becomes available, which is not a regular system shell, but it is a PHP uh, interactive shell. And it looks like it times out. So we're just going to run that again. Okay. So what I need is, oh God, uh, I have not written PHP code in like 15 years, showing my age there. So, hmm. Let's do some basic PHP functions like get current directory, get CWD, get C, get CWD, root. Um, okay. We're just going to need basically all the file system functions. Uh, let's have a look at directories. Change the, the, open the, read the, scan the. So scan the returns an array of files and directories. So if we do, um, scan the string, and uh, let's make it, oh, okay. We don't even need to assign it to a variable. So let's do scanned uh, home, Berlin, Dali, Nairobi, Oslo, Professor. So I think these are our local usernames. Let's, um, Let's grab some of this goodness. So we keep some notes. Um, web server local usernames. Okay. Then let's be cheeky and try slash root. Mission design. Okay. So let's work out which user we are. Mm, HP command execution. I think it's just CMD exec. Exec ID. Fatal error called to undefined function exec. Is used to execute a command in the operating system shell or terminal. Exact. Well, well, exact. Hmm. Um, okay. exact less called undefined function shell exec. Let's just Google this because I would really like to be able to run commands 
from this shell. Yeah, I know there's like a bunch of risky functions that you can control via the PHP ini or PHP config, like at a system level. Um, maybe that's the case here. PHP ini. If you're not the root on the machine and the exec function is disabled, then you can't enable it by yourself. PHP any disable functions. This directive allows you to disable certain functions for security reasons. It takes on a common the limited list of function names. If some disable functions is not affected by safe mode. So most of PHP any, I know you can see through PHP info. Uh, Yeah, I think most of these reflect the PHP ini or PHP config. So we're looking for disabled functions and safe mode. Disabled classes, disable functions. Yeah, exec, pass through, shell exec, system. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can't use in the context of this PHP shell, PHP interpreter. So I'm going to copy that just so we know what is effectively blacklisted. Um, and then I think the next thing I want to test is, can we read files that we have permission to? Um, so that might be scanda etc php, no such directory. PHP 7. Seven. Ah. Oh my God. PHP.ini. Failed to open directory, not a directory. Okay. So. Now we need a PHP function to read file. Direct IO. I'll get contents. I'll get contents. File name is the string, similar to file. Reads an entire file into an array. File, etc, php7, php.ini. Oh, 
Okay, so we can read files. We just can't run arbitrary system commands. PHP ini I don't really care about because we've already seen the bulk of it through the PHP info function. Um, so let's have a quick think about what we want to do. Uh, grabbing some of the source code for here would be good. Um, to see what's kind of going on under the hood for both the HTTP, which is looks to be the registration and the HTTPS, which looks to be the login using a client side certificate. So we want scander. Let's just assume or guess bar www.html. Nope. Um, what we could do is look at the Apache config. So that's etc. It's either going to be Apache or HTTP. Uh, okay. So yeah, how do we find the web route? Let's just poke around a bit. Bin boot dev Etsy home lib media mount opt might be one. Um, let's have a look opt. Nope, just random tools. Uh, run. Okay, that's all the PID files. Yeah, I'm not familiar. I think, this is, I mean, normally these hosts are um, Ubuntu, right? Or Debian. But I think this is a, a different Linux distro. I'm not super familiar with. It doesn't look like there's an issue, uh, release. Yeah, no Etsy release file. No. Let's have a look at the MOTD. MOTD. Oh, we need to read the file. So just file. Well, let's see. MOTD. Got some cool ASCII art. La Casa de Papel. Okay. Oops. Okay, clear works, cool. So, let's go back to our enum. It's not actually HTTP, did it? Is it? It's Node.js, and then it's using the Express framework. Node.js Express middleware, although these are two different banners, right? This one has got Express middleware, this one says Express framework. So let's consult Dr. Google node JS web root. Uh, not super familiar with node JS. It's local file system stuff. 
Node.js default path lights. Where was Node.js installed? Yeah, it's just going to depend on the distro, on the package manager. Um, we can't run things like Pac-Man to figure it out. I mean, there's a chance that it's... Um, what was it, Scanda? No. Yeah, Scanda. And uh, I mean, there's a chance that it's running like in a home directory. Berlin. I mean, there's a node modules, a server JS and a user text there. So that looks like a node application to me. Um, Ash history what is Ash shell. Oh. Lightweight Unix shell, never heard of Ash. Um, which Linux distro use Ash shell default? It's variant dash is the default shell in Debian and Ubuntu. Um, that's a bit of a side mission that we're going on there. So home Berlin, uh, let's just grab this so we don't have to keep going back and forth. Okay. Dali. Again, we've got like a server, JS. I mean, there's an SSH directory there. Uh, okay, let's grab that. Just so we can figure out where we want to spend our time enumerating. Nairobi. CA.key. Okay. Uh, that looks like another web app, node module server JS static. So let's save that. And a slow and professor. Oops. Oh, yeah. Okay. Shell's a little bit sensitive. Scanned, uh, um, um, so we want Oslo okay. and Professor. Okay, this one's got a node modules. M cached. So it doesn't necessarily look like a web root. Um, Linux dev file system get user ID. So, oh, sorry, it's going to be proc, isn't it? Proc pid status. I mean, that's to find a running process. All right, again, side mission. So I think we probably just start from the top, Berlin. Let's have a look at 
server.js and user.txt. So file, hopefully we have permissions, home, Berlin, server.js. Permission denied. Dang it. Um, Berlin user.txt. Oops, user.txt, no permissions. SSH. Uh, well, that's a directory home Berlin dot home Berlin dot SSH. Mission denied. Okay. Not liking our chances here. Uh, Dali. Dali. Server. Server.js. No permissions. Um, Nairobi. Nairobi. SSH Nairobi dot Nairobi dot SSH. Oh, there is no dot SSH. Let's try file file home Nairobi server. JS cannot hmm what about this dot e ba dot key aha okay that one we did have permission to so let's definitely grab that What else is in Nairobi? So with server.js cannot, um, maybe index.jade. Index.jade. Oh. Really hard when you can't see the permissions on anything, just the file name. Uh, let's try Oslo. Oslo. Uh, we'll just try server.js. Okay. Nothing really. And then I assume this professor thing. Um, I mean, let's try it. Home professor memcached. Home professor memcached.js. Any? Huh, okay. So program memcached man sudo minus you nobody. Hmm. That's definitely worth keeping for future reference. Okay. So what do we do with this key? If we go back to the HTTPS site, certificate error, sorry, but you need to provide a client certificate to continue. Oh God. So, um,
Where do we start? Um, if the Patrick has anything to say, uh, client side certificate. So what I like, what has got me interested is that this is called CA, which usually means the certificate authority. Um, and it's the certificate authority that does the certificate issuing usually. Um, these are all the attributes of a certificate. Uh, revocation, certificate transparency, logs, M format, DER format, P7B is a base64 version. So you can use OpenSSL to convert back and forth between these formats. But how do I, like I've never even installed a certificate in a browser to use for anything. Well, I mean, I think I have, but it was like a long time ago. So Firefox use a uh, client certificate. How do we import a client certificate to Firefox? Very suitable for highly secure. HTTPS, blah, blah, blah. So you go into preferences, certificates, view certificates, your certificates, right? So this is where you have uh, like a repository in your browser config and you install a certificate from that you get given in order to visit the website. Your certificate file, usually pkcs12, um, and then you'll see it here. So create and export a client certificate, yeah. So I think we want to use open SSL, um, create and sign certificate with CA. We've already got our CA. Create your own. It's a signing request. Self certificates, self sign certificates with keys in OpenSSL. Okay. Key for service certificate, right? Uh, but we don't want to do node, do we? Hmm. I don't want to set all these options up. I just want to use like a whole bunch of defaults. Okay, so this is creating the CA key, CA dot key, right? Yeah, that's what we've got. So that's the common naming convention is CA dot key. Create the certificate. We don't want to create certificate pair for node, which is like an intermediary in PKI for signing. So we just want to Yeah, I mean, this is an example for signing certificates for Okay. Uh, 
Oh god, this is like setting up a whole PKI. Mm. Uh, use C A key. <laughs> uh, certificate and key abuse. Certified pre-owned Active Directory certificate services. Abuse of risk issuance, blah, blah, blah. AD certificate services, no. Uh, so sign certificate using CA.E. I mean, we can get the cert itself, which is going to be in here, right? Uh, yeah, but that is the cert itself. Let's hold on to that. Um, okay. That's generating the CA itself. Mm. Create certificate signing request. New key. Key out. It's my key. And uh huh. And then we use the CA subcommand out certificate. And, and then we pass in the certificate signing request. Okay, this is a little closer to what I'm thinking. Um, so first things first, let's get this key cleaned up and um, saved in our working directory so we can start to use it. So, Sorry, I should be doing some funky 400 different Vim commands to do this, but I, it would be quicker, honestly, for me to just do this. Quite embarrassing. Could use Sublime. But I'm here now and I'm halfway done, so. Really need to get better on my shell skills. So can we do replace? Yeah, let's do slash n n quote and replace all. Yep, great. Okay, that did the job. So we're going to grab this. Oh, we want to. Hmm, okay. There's an extra space in there.
Now we should be Gucci. Copy that. And stick it in a file in our working directory. Vim ca.p. Paste. Done. A.p. Looks good. Yep. No extra lines. Then, yeah, look, Dirtbuster turned up for this random stuff. Uh, it's all 400, it's not 200, so it's probably not worth investigating. Um, ah, still in the directory from last box that we did, 181. So now we want to, uh, looks like we do need a ca.conf. So ca default, the cert, the cadb.cert. I mean, do we really need all this? I think we're going to need the certificate because to do the signing, you need both the key and the certificate. So uh, I know we can use OpenSSL um, download to get our key. Mm. OpenSSL SCRS client, which is like this raw client. Okay, let's steal this. Uh, but is that going to be the CA certificate or it's the certificate that is being generated to use for the HTTPS website, right? It's not going to be the CA certificate necessarily. Uh, okay. Oh, download pen. Okay. Let's move, um, downloads, la casa star to here. Let's at la casa hdb chain dot pen. And Same, same. Okay, so it's not like it's multiple certificates chained together. Right, let's try and figure out a command line to make this work. So I think the first thing we want to do is create the certificate signing request. Um, RSA 1024, we'll change it to 2048 just to be the same as this particular set. Um, and what else? Nodes, don't know what that is. Key out, out files. Okay. All right, fingers crossed this works. <clears throat> Let's change that to 2048. And now we need to put in all the different attributes, right? But does it really matter? I don't think so. Server FQDN with your name. Let's put in the same CN. Nope, don't want that. So now we've got our key and request. So OpenSSL CA certificate.pem.crt in files. So 
Let's have a look at open SSL CA uh, command line minimal CA application. So you can use config file. I don't want to go through that if I can avoid it, avoid it. But can I just provide the CA? Yeah, the private key to sign request with. Okay. So I can potentially replace that with key file ca.com. All right. Let's give it a go. Key file. Key file ca. Unable uh, using configuration from user libs SSL cannot read CA private CA key from CA dot key. CA dot key. Uh, there's no space on the end. Mm. In private key and private key. Maybe it's using a path from that default SSL comp and we need to say explicitly no. Um, okay, let's go back to this guy. Assuming there's no password. So in files, could be the last option. Yep. My rec.m. Yep. Request. Mm. So I'm wondering if we can skip the whole CSR step, right? Um, uh, open SSL request key. Let's go open SSL. Sure, I've done this before. So PKCS ten. Um,
Let's find the file to read the private key from. Um, open SSL rec, create certificate using private key. Rec. New key, key out, yeah, it's kind of like just self-signed self -signed certificate, right? Yeah, but we don't want to create CSR, it's like a... Use this method if you already have a private key that you'd like to request a certificate from a CA. Based on an existing private key. Generate a CSR from an existing certificate and private key. No. Generate a self-signed certificate. Generate a self signed certificate from an existing private key. This command creates a self signed certificate from an existing private key. X509 option tells REC to create a self signed certificate. Days option specifies that it's valid for. New option enables the CSR information prompt. Mm. Okay, this is looking the best so far. Generate a self sun certificate from the existing private key in CSR. Create a private key, verify a private key. Verify a private key matches a certificate in a CSR. Encrypt a private key. Convert formats. Open SSL sort of version. All right, this is pretty thorough. Man, Digital Ocean always has good documentation. I love it. Um, generate a self-signed self certificate from an existing private key. Okay, let's try this. So let's do some cleanup before we do anything. So we'll rm my key.m rm my rec .m. Everything else is valid. Then we're going to do open SSL rec. Nodes key out. Uh, nope. So key is going to be the domain key. Key is ca.key. New x509 days 100 and then out. It's going to be attempt one dot crt. Could not read private key from ca.key. Um, man, I think we might have screwed up the key somehow, like one character somewhere. So let's go back. Let's jump into the shell. Let's do file. 
to file, let's do file, home, Nairobi, which one was it? Nairobi ca.t. Nairobi, Nairobi ca.t. Um, because PHP is reading it into an array, I mean, I'm assuming it doesn't need to be there, right? Um, Just wondering if there's a cleaner way to do this without all of the various encoding and decoding and everything else. Um, let's have a little Google. Uh, PHP echo file contents. Well, so we're using the file function. I'll get contents. Um, yeah, so this reads it into a single string, whereas this is an array and has all this escapism going on and, and everything else, right? So I think file get contents might be better, quote unquote. So let's run file get contents. Still the same, but it's a string. Let's try assigning it to a variable. Um, can you click over here? Yeah, can. Ah, that's better. Because this is like dumping all the type information, the triple quotes, everything else, right? So let's try this. Okay, control C. Uh, Vim ca dot key. Okay. Paste it in and let's try running this. Oh yeah. So it was a problem. I mean, look, the rec and the other command that we tried both complained about not being able to read the private key. So it was definitely worth going back and trying to find a different way to do that and make sure it was done properly. Um, and there was no missed or erroneous characters or anything else. So now we should have attempt one dot cert. Yep. Um, now can we just import that straight into good old Firefox? Settings. Certificates, uh, my certificates, import, pack the box, 181, PKCS12. Okay. Is this going to work? 509 certificate, open. This personal certificate can't be installed because you do not own the corresponding private key, which was created when the certificate was requested. Okay. There's no other file for attempt one dots. Yeah, it's just a certificate, right? PKI does my head in. Um, 
let's try this format. Um, I have a feeling that the I have a feeling that the um I don't know. So X509. Uh, convert X509 to PK is it ASC 12, something like that. How to convert X509 in key to a PKCS, PKCS 12. Mm. It's using some library. But X509 to M. Okay, sorry, slight interruption there. So, common conversion, X509 to PEM. X509 in, out form PEM, out certificate. Uh, M format is the most common format used for certificates. Base encoded ASCII files. Uh, okay, let's just try this. Open SSL X509. Open SSL X509. In is attempt one dot set. Out form is M. Out file name is going to be attempt one dot M. Okay, no errors. Let's try and install it. Personal certificate can't be installed because you do not own the corresponding private key. Okay. Let's see if this is a common thing. Oh, okay. Cat the set and key together into one file. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, like you gotta just chain them together. So we're gonna do cat attempt one dot CRT and CA dot B into attempt one A dot M. Oh boy. Let's see if it works. One A. 
No. Okay. So I'm thinking that let's just let's remove attempt. Ah. Oh, we can just leave it. Go back to our. Um, thing here, certificate creation and signing using the CA key. Um, right. What else are we missing? Yeah, it's 509. If this option is specified, then if a private key is created, it will not be encrypted. So, I guess it's worth adding that. Common name uh, is going to be the domain name. Oh, shit. Um, yeah, let's just remove all this stuff. Okay. Run that again. OU common name, domain name, app attempt one. Uh, okay, let's view, import, all. Hmm. EKCS twelve. Open SSL convert to PKCS twelve. Oh boy, solo wins. They haven't got the greatest track history in this respect, but uh, open is still PKCS12 export. So we pass in the signed certificate, we pass in the CA.key, we give it a name, and then, yeah, okay. I think this is what we're looking for. So let's go back and do this. So our cert name is, our signed certificate is attempt1.pem. The key that we used is ca.key. Um, name let's just drop that i don't know if it needs it or not our out file is going to be attempt one p12 export password blank blank 
cat attempt one dot p12. Whoa, yeah, okay, so it's like a uh, binary format. Okay. Let's try Dr. Google uh, attempt.p12. Enter so the password that was used to encrypt the certificate. None. Ah, yeah, that's better. So it's got the right CN. Now, I'm assuming it's just going to match on the CN, right? So if we now go here. Um, sorry, but you need to provide a client certificate to continue. Actually, presenting the certificate. Mm. Hmm. I'm wondering because it's like this. Okay, so that's my certificate. That's the certificate presented by the web server. So RSA 2048, RSA 2048, R256 with RSA. R256 with RSA, and then see, I've got all this other junk in here, like country, organization, etc. So I'm wondering if I need it to match not just the common name, but This is causing the browser to not send the certificate. Um. They're all the CAs that are, exist in the browser certificate store. All right, I'm gonna delete this. Uh, and then, okay, let's go back and let's remove this. And let's just go through the whole process again. So this is the certificate creation. So we don't want a country. If you enter dot, the field will be left blank, right? So if I look at the certificate that's been issued to the web server, the only two is CN and organization. Uh, so we want blank, blank, organization name is that. Organizational unit is blank. Common name is going to be that. Email address is going to be blank. And then we convert it to P12 and a password. Go back to here. View certificates, import, temp1.p12, no password. 
let's have a look at it. Yeah, it doesn't have all that other kind of junk in the certificate metadata. Let's try. Mm. What is going on? How? No, I'm just going to Google this. Um, Firefox client side certificate not being presented. Don't access a company the website that requires a certificate. I have the correct certificate in preferences, blah, blah, blah. It's there. Same certificate I successfully use on Chrome. I just get 400, no required SSL certificate was sent. Seems that Firefox will only prompt if you have already imported a certificate signed by the same issuer who has signed sites SSL certificate. So you get your CA to sign both the server and the client certificates, then import the sign, and the next time you visit their Firefox, will notice it has Client certificate signed by the same CA as the server's SSL certificate, so it'll prompt you whether to use this or not. So do I need to import the CA into Firefox? Um, certificates. Authorities. Import. Do you want to trust La Casa del de Papel? Trust the CA to identify websites. Yep, fine, whatever. And now I've got that. Come on. Oh, yes, there we go. So I just requested that you identify yourself with a certificate. That's the one we want. That's our client certificate. Yeah, all right, Back into your little club. Season one, season two. What's this guy doing? What is this? Oh, I don't know if I want to watch this. This is like a members only. Some we don't. I mean, they're all zero bytes. So I'm not going to open anything. Uh, past season one. Okay, past is always a bit of a red flag. Let's go back. Season two. And then file, 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 file. There's not a lot of difference between the file names. Not the file names themselves. The file names are just incrementing by one, but the actual String here seems to be very similar, or just one or two characters different. Uh, you can see there it's like the last uh, bytes one, two, three, four, five, and six from the right. Um, hmm. I mean, this is obviously the next step, right? Is getting access to this private members area. Um, let's 
So let's just mess around with this. Season one. Let's see password. Nope, I don't think so. Oh, but this is blank now, which is interesting. So there's no season one season. Oh, okay, there's some error. No such file or directory. Scander home. <laughs> okay. So if we go one, two, th if we go back three, then just try the Etsy directory. Because I think it's trying to list the directory. So when there's nothing there, right? When path is season one, it's looking in that home Berlin uh, thing and it's getting the directory contents. So if I do back four, one, two, three, four, and then do Etsy. Yeah, there you go. Looks like we got ourselves a good old fashioned LFI. So the path variable will let us get the directory contents. But if we go back to here, So that's enumerating the directory and then, yep, path is season one. Can we get file contents? So if we look at this, it's gonna be copy link, paste, that just starts a download. In this case, a zero byte file. But what is this? I mean, <clears throat> this looks like Rock 13 or Base 64 or something. Um, uh, coding, decoding. Uh, sorry, Rock 13. Rotted text. Decrypt. So here's all the different ASCII. Uh, sorry, the different ROT13 schemas, if you like. But all that's going to do is just shift the bits around. Um, cipher detect. Yeah, this website is ciphertext analyze. I've used this before. It gives you some recommendations. Uh, I've not heard of these ciphers. <clears throat> Let's just try base 64. So I thought base 64 always ended in an equal sign, but I know that's not the case in every, every scenario, every single case. What is it? Oh, okay. So that base 64 decoded is season one dash zero one AVI. Ha! Ah. So we know that the season one directory is four directories up from root. So if I do encode one, two, three, 
for etc password uh, encrypt. And then I take this string. And then I put it into not the path, but the file parameter, I think it is. File, yeah. So uh, it's not a get parameter, it's a URL parameter. So slash file slash string. Oh my God. <laughs> Password downloaded 1.5 kilobytes. Uh, let's move downloads password to here. Cat password. Yeah. So we have a full LFI through this website that we created our own certificate for. And it um it um is running as this berlin user and we know that because if we put a uh invalid no it was the yeah, if we, huh? What the hell? Where's our website gone? Come on. Is my internet down? Restart my VPN. What the? Ten, 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 one. Uh, okay. Where is the website? Stopped working. HTTPS La Casa. Man, that thing just straight up um, rejects the connection. Yeah, about 480. Oh, I think we might have killed the um, node server. Running behind it. Uh, is our shell still working? Um, mm, 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 mm. So port 80 is up, FPT is up, SSH is up. But 443 is gone. I think we crashed the the node application or something. Um, rather than try and troubleshoot this, I am just going to recycle the box. Um, luckily, I'm the only one doing this at the moment, I think. And yeah, so just while that's resetting, <clears throat> we can have a bit of a recap. So two websites, one that presented you with a QR code to scan into Google Authenticator, supply the one-time code that's generated from that token, along with an email address, hit submit, and that's kind of like how you register for this private club thing. Um, but no obvious way of doing anything uh, of any kind of, you know, vector or anything to be exploited. I mean, we could probably continue to probe the destination that that form is submitted to, um, but 
I think we're on to some other stuff here, right? So then we had a look at VS FTP'd. It had um, a backdoor baked into the official release. Um, it was basically uh, a version of the software that was compromised. Um, and then it went out on the internet and anyone who installed that um, is basically, yeah, it's backdoored. So you just log in with a smiley face and then it starts a PHP shell called SciShell on what, 6200, I think it was. So we we're able to log into that. Using that, we were not able to um, explicitly run system, uh, explicitly uh, ask PHP to run a system level command or process. So it wasn't like a full shell, um, but we were able to dig around in the file system. We found uh, ca.key um, and then on the HTTPS website, uh, it was asking for a client certificate. After much experimentation, we were able to uh, sign our own certificate, uh, install that in the browser, that became a client side certificate. We've logged into the uh, application on 443 and we've discovered that there's a really robust LFI um, uh, LFI uh, vulnerability in that application. That's kind of where we're up to. So let's just check if 443 is back. Oh, we're not getting instantly connection closed. Server might still be coming up. Yeah. Cool. Let's give it another few seconds because it might still be starting. And let's just clean some of this up. Our PHP shell is still there. And what we were doing, we were attempting to, uh, we were able to grab the Etsy password. And I just wanted to go back and double check the, uh, let's close some of this stuff. The web root. And the way that we would check the web root was, GPS site uh, automatically presents a certificate because we um, we told the browser to do so before. So let's just change this to some something different. So the path which reads the uh, directory or folder contents, it, uh, the path get variable gives us directory uh, contents and then slash file slash my file in base64 gives us the content of the file and downloads it for us. It's very nice. Uh, okay, let's just go back. Season one, and the way that we got it before was we just gave it a incorrect directory name. And basically that threw an error error was not uh, turned off from client side. So we know it's home Berlin download season three. And using this shell, we were able to um, look at the contents of the directory, home Berlin. Uh, so this is where the HTTPS is running and we've got the user.txt there, right? So we'll definitely grab that. That's going to be the user flag. Um, so we'll use the LFI to grab that in a minute. Uh, let's just do it now, actually. So what we want is um, actually, if we just go back here, Home Berlin downloads. Yeah, so that's the root that the path variable and the file variable is looking at. 
So to get user.txt, we want to go down one directory. Uh, so let's do user.txt. I could probably be using a shell to do this much faster, but hey, I'm feeling lazy. Let's grab that and stick it into the slash file slash that user.txt. And now we're going to MV downloads user.txt into this directory. We're going to cat that. And we're going to grab that and stick it in the box. Wonderful. Okay, that's the first flag captured. Now, when we were, we weren't 100% sure which user um, the PHP shell was running as. Um, so we were able to grab things like most things were permission denied with the exception of this CA key. So I think it was, you know, deliberately loosened up. So you'd be able to get access to that. But all of these, or most of these guys have a, actually Berlin is the only one that has a SSH rate. Oh, professor as well. So let's use the, uh, directory LFI or DFI to see if we can access the uh, SSH key. Well, see if we can see what's in the directory. So it should be just as simple as, uh, so that's downloads. So is it just dot SSH? Yeah. Cool. IDRSA is what we want. So now we'll do dot dot. Um, so it's going to be dot 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 SS, SSH IDRSA. Let's grab that. And Oh, we need the encoded version. And we will do slash file. The RSA, beautiful. So that's Berlin user. So MV downloads ID RSA to here. And I think we can get rid of this. And so we're going to SSH minus I ID RSA uh, Berlin at 10, 10, 10, 1. Yes. First key verification failed. Yes. Oh. Why is that not using the key? Open SSH private key, yeah. So is the key password protected? Um, hmm, sorry, I'm just trying to think this through. Um, OK, 
Okay. So if we do I mean let's grab the rest, right? Um authorize keys. Oh. No known hosts no hosts And we also want the pop key. I don't know if it's of any use, but I'm just going to snag it anyway. Um, I don't think it's going to be of any use. So I'm guessing what? If the key is protected with a password, then it has a different prompt, like SSH gives you a different prompt, like for the key password, but it looks like it's prompting the actual login password and it's ignoring the fact that it's doing key-based. Um, so how do you say pub, authorized keys and known hosts. Have a look. Cat authorized keys. Cat ID RSA. Pub. Yep. So that's definitely a pub key. And Berlin. At la 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 la. And known hosts. Hmm. That doesn't look like he's made SSH connection out. But I think about this. Shouldn't this key, the public key, be the same as what's in authorized keys? And this is tech at tech mac dot local. So this key and the corresponding private key is not going to work for this guy because it's not in his authorized key list. He's got these other ones. So it's like he created a private key on the server or himself to SSH out elsewhere. But for SSH in, he's using this key, which we don't have the private key for. So, um, Mm. Who else has SSH? So Berlin, Dali doesn't have, an, uh, Dali does. So Dali, not RRB, not Oslo, and Professor. So I'm thinking we give Dali and Professor a try with this key. I don't know. Uh, one thing. Dali, no. Hey. Okay. Um, 
chmod id uh, chmod what are you gonna set it to six uh, zero six zero yeah okay so the key that we fetched from the berlin user didn't work for the Berlin user. He's got some other um, key pair that he uses, which the private key was not available for. Um, but, you know, it's a bit of a password spray attack, I guess, to figure out how to um, um, Yeah, password spraying, I guess, to try and, you know, the equivalent of password spraying with a key. So we were, we did see this mem cached any before, and it had this sudo command, which was interesting. Um, there's mem cached.js. Oh, okay. So the any file is owned by root. The JS file is user is root, group is nobody. And he's not a member of root nobody, but looking at this, he can pseudo as nobody, right? Go minus L but we don't have his password. Pseudo minus you, nobody. So can we run node? User in node. Uh, it keeps prompting. Um, but how do we do that? Um, yeah, so, I mean, that command, which is in the mcached ini file, is there, right? It's the running process. But CPU time is resetting. Ten, I mean, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. But the CPU time um, restarted before. See that changes. Yeah, I see that. So, <clears throat> so this memcached.ini 
the command in here is getting run by nobody every, I don't know, like minute or something. And we can tell that because the process CPU time uh, changes. I might uh, just validate this a little bit further. Um, so I do have a copy of this guy. Oh. Downloads, e spy here. Um, then we want to uh, server. And then we want to do an here, w get HTTP 10, 10, 14, 26, which is my IP, 8,000, P spy 64. P spy 64. Executable mm. bit. Yeah. P spy 64. Okay, let's watch. Uh, Supervisor D. Okay. Um. Not seeing the node binary firing up. Is that because it's a child process or something else? Start, stop naming. So, supervisor D is being restarted. I do PS, yeah, 11, 13. Yeah, now it's gone, and then it's back again. Okay. So, vim memcache.ini, v-i-memcache.ini, read only. Right, read only. mcache.ini I 
later. Oh, I can delete it. Oh, crap. What was the contents? Uh oh. That was it. Okay. Phew. So if I can delete it. <clears throat> and create a new one, right? And then the new one is owned by me, so I can modify it. Okay, let's figure this out. Let's look at what the previous command was. So I'm guessing. Anyway, let's put it back into the original file name. We now have control over. Probably have right access to. So hmm. So the pseudo nobody is great. Um, it's not pseudoing from the professor user because that would require a password, right? If we uh, do pseudo, like we can't even list etc pseudo as. Yeah, we can't see anything about that if we try and uh, if we even tr if we try and do anything with sudo, we get prompted for a password. So there's no passwordless commands, I believe. That's how it works. So what is what is firing up this? Um, memcached job, so to speak. Um, I mean, we see this guy keep getting restarted, right, as well, in piece by. So I'm assuming, like, you know a little bit about supervise or uh, it's kind of like cron process control. Not meant to be. Um, I mean, it's running as root. Running as root, so supervisor D is launching this guy. 
then I would assume if we take out the sudo to nobody, then our process is going to run as root. Supervisor D. ETC supervisor conf D. That's the main cache. I mean, that's just the start memcache, mkhd. Um, we got our HTTP server here. So let's go back and just do a little test. Let's do memcache by memcache.ini and change this command to wget http n10 14 let's see Mm -hmm. seven. Oh, there it is. So actually makes a couple of attempts. One, two, three, four. And Oh, we didn't check if it was what user it was running as. Assuming it's going to be root, let's get a reverse shell attempt. Rev shell uh, 10, 10, 14, 26, 9001. Yep. And we just want like regular shell, right? Uh, bash. What's the normal one? I think that's it. Do it again. Man, okay, so we know it executes that. We believe it's going to be as root. So technically, if this reverse shell command is correct, um, oh, why UDP? We don't want UDP. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, we don't want UDP. Let's do this. TCP, and we need a listener. Yeah, oops. Yeah, yeah, NBLP. 9001. Save that. With any luck. Come on. Waiting game. I feel like it's been long enough.
Let's just try it. I'm create dev TCP. Dev TCP. Uh, I mean, it's going to fail because I think in order to touch anything in dev TCP, you have to be root, right? Um, Let's just try bash instead. I don't know with this ash cell, what's going on? I have to make the any file more permissive. No, because we saw that it was able to read and then make a w get call, which we saw on here, right? So we know it's not going to be. Uh, some sort of screwy permissions. Mm. Yeah, I'm wondering. Hang on. So, I mean, this was port 1000, it's 9001, so it's not like a problem with a high order port. Um, what's going on? How can we troubleshoot this from PS5? So that's a mem cached daemon. That's the different uh, web applications. Let me see, run. Yeah, there it is, right? Let's try something else. Bash reverse shell. Bash shell two shell. Bash TCP. I think this is exactly the same, but just for my own sanity. M cache of any uh, command equals and equals ten ten fourteen two six nine thousand one. Uh, let's look at the original cat EMP. So it's not like there's any escaping or, you know, quotes or anything that's going on here. It's literally just interpreting the whole string. Um, Okay. 
Okay, supervisee, supervisor D seems to be restarting stuff every, I don't know, minute, 90 seconds or something. Can't exactly see what the configuration is, but we know that if we change it to wget to our box, it works. And we haven't seen the reverse shell command run yet. Let's give it another minute. Yeah, so supervisor D is starting with UID zero, so it's definitely running as root. is my reverse shell. Come on. Saw it before, right? The bash dev TCP. Waiting, waiting, waiting. I haven't seen it run yet. Nothing there. Come on. I think we might try wrapping a bash around this. So what is it? Bash C. Let's see So it's I for interactive, it's C for pass a command. Um, let's see if need to wait for the supervisor D to restart because the fact that the bash um, command wasn't even popping up in the process list has me a little concerned. So it doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. Well, it might hurt. I don't know. Kind of brute forcing my way through this thing. Ah, oh, bash minus I. Okay. Please. Oh yeah, there it is. ID root. Uh, let's go into slash root. Let's at root .txt. There it is. Wow. Okay. Another really interesting box. Um, So yeah, once we, we, we kind of did a recap or while waiting for the box to restart, um, it was, um, we were up to the LFI. So through the, uh, web app running on HTTPS, we were able to, um, using the LFI, we were able to snag the, uh, a SSH private key by comparing the uh, 
um, authorized keys and the pub key, we realized that the SSH private key was not actually um, in the authorized keys list for the Berlin user. We then worked out which other users through the uh, PHP shell um, that we had had a .ssh directory. There was two, um, and then that private key that we got from the Berlin directory worked for the professor user. In the professor home directory, there was a file called mcached.ini. Uh, it was running a command by sudoing to nobody, running node, running some script or something. Uh, we didn't have read write, but I guess because of directory inheritance, we were uh, permission inheritance at the top level, we were able to, to delete it uh, and then replace it with our own code, which we used as a um, reverse shell. And then we had to fiddle around with that to make it work. So cool. Overall, very fun, very enjoyable. Definitely learned some new techniques here. Um, the client side certificate was definitely something, um, you know, like I need to brush up on my PKI and everything else. That's definitely an area to study. Um, all the different formats, the different stages of certificate requests and signing and everything else uh, can be a little bit overwhelming, but found some good resources online in the end. And, uh, yeah, overall a really cool box, really enjoyed it. So, wow. Uh, Yep, another three hour uh, exercise. Um, <laughs> I'd like to get these down to, you know, like kind of like 45 minutes, but the reality is like, you know, discovering tools and techniques and everything else along the way. So a little bit tricky. Um, yeah, so if you've made it to the end here, thank you very much for your uh, uh, participation in the process. Like I mentioned in the opening, um, this is about um, me documenting my kind of journey uh moving towards a bigger body of knowledge when it comes to offensive security or pen testing or red teaming whatever you want to call it and uh yeah i just want to kind of share it with the world to make myself a little account a little bit accountable and hopefully it helps you know at least one other person out there who's on the same journey uh if you have enjoyed it please uh drop a like or subscribe um comment whatever it might be we'll always do my best to clarify or help and uh, yeah, it's uh, been a pleasure doing this. Um, planning to continue to do it and start a new series as well on some other um, tools and uh, other topics uh, along the way that I learned. Like for example, GoBuster. Uh, it's something that I continually um, bump into new issues. So I might do like a little tutorial video on how to use GoBuster, that sort of thing. Anyway, that's it. Uh, three hours and oh, two hours and 54 minutes. So yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, all one take, no edits. And uh, thanks for sticking around. My name's Jono from Open Learn Sec, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.